Let's turn together into God's Word to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. We're continuing our series on the pillars of the faith. Now, if you look at your outline, uh, you may swallow hard because I have three main points with three points under each three main points, which my quick math is nine points. Um, no, we're just going to take each of these sections uh, as their own. And I really actually, as I headed into this sermon, didn't think I would spend, you know, Jonah's pretty concise story, an easy one to tell quick, you know, with our, with our pillars of the faith, this one would move pretty quickly. But Jonah's message to Nineveh is one of repentance. But the message of the book of Jonah is a living illustration of repentance. Jonah, his life, preaches repentance and a picture of what that process looks like. And so today we're going to start with the issue of sin. As Barney Fife was once quoted saying in an episode of Andy Griffith, uh, that's a topic you can't talk too much about. Uh, sin is certainly uh, a topic that, that we need to confront. But here's, here's the reality. Let me just cut to the quick. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he relieved us of the penalty of sin. Praise the Lord. That our account, our debt for sin was paid, and its penalty was paid. But Jesus' victory over sin goes to more than just taking care of the penalty. It deals with sin itself. And as a follower of Christ, as one who knows Jesus as my Lord, his precious blood isn't just available to cancel the debt, but to set me free from sin now. Now, as a human being, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, and we all struggle with sin, but I don't need to live as its dog. I don't need to live in its bondage. And the power of Christ in my life, and a life lived with a repentant heart, a contrite and daily repentant heart can confront the matter of sin, and we can experience that victory of Christ over sin now. And the life of Jonah will illustrate the depth and ugliness of sin. Here's this prophet, this great man of God who falls hard and far. Then we'll see his journey of repentance in the belly of the whale. But we'll also see life after repentance, too. And we're going to look at each one of those topics. Today, we're going to look at sin. And we're going to look primarily at Jonah chapter 1. So let's take a look at that together. Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, can you, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us. Who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running from, away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to the land, 
but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Now, very quickly, I think most of us know the rest of the story. He, in chapter 2, Jonah prays a, an amazing prayer of repentance, an acknowledgment of the sovereignty of God and God's goodness, even in the, in the belly of, of the whale, in the belly of the great fish. Then he's vomited up on the shore, and God calls him again to go to Nineveh and preach, and he does. And there's a great revival there. In fact, they even put the animals in sackcloth. That's how sincere they are in repenting in Nineveh, the, the, the capital of the Assyrians. But Jonah is disturbed and troubled that God would relent in his calamity upon the Assyrians, a people he clearly hates. And he goes out outside the city and he pouts. And God uses a vine to teach Jonah the lesson that God cares for people, even the animals too, and that his desires at all would come to him. And so that's the story of Jonah. And with that in mind, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, we, we go before you and we're going we're gonna to look an ugly topic in the face, sin. But we do so for the sake of freedom. We do so for the sake of joy. We do so for the sake of our relationship with you. Today, as your people, I know the, the quality of the hearts of the people here, who are here today and are willing to do that hard work, are willing to, to, to talk about those uncomfortable things. They don't come to have their ears tickled, but their, their souls transformed. And so, Lord, today, as, as we look at the topic of sin and, and that ugliness that separates us from you, Lord, I just pray that whatever conviction needs to come upon all of us, that you'll speak to our hearts so that we can experience that beautiful, wonderful freedom, not just from the penalty of sin, but from its reality in our lives now. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Begin with a simple question. What? was Jonah's sin? You say, well, that's simple. He, he disobeyed God. God spoke to him, said, go preach to Nineveh, and he literally goes in the opposite direction. He heads towards Tarshish, which would be kind of the modern, the modern day area of Spain. He literally picked the other side of the world from a Hebrew's point of view. It was considered uh, Tarshish, the, 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 the Straits of Gibraltar there, was literally considered kind of the gates of the sea. You know, I'm getting out of here and going as far as I can. A modern equivalent. I don't know if there's a modern equivalent to how far Jonah was trying to go to get away from God. Maybe, maybe the moon. I mean, because our ability to go anywhere in the world very quickly and rather easily um, is, 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 you know, be like finding something very remote and having to hike to the center of it. I mean, we're talking about a very dangerous and distant journey. And you say, well, that's very easy to say what Jonah's sin is. But if, if, if we were going to get very legalistic about the matter, an argument could be made in Jonah's behalf, show me the law he violated. Here he is a Hebrew. Here he is a Hebrew who's called to follow the covenant and law of Moses. What law did he violate? Show me chapter and verse. For what scripture dictates that it's necessary for an individual to go to a foreign land, an enemy, particularly in the Hebrew law and that of Mo and Moses and that which preceded Jonah in the scriptures, what would have dictated that it was necessary for him to go to Nineveh and preach against it. And brothers and sisters, you would say that's ridiculous. God shows up into his life and says, do something. Clearly he sinned. But brothers and sisters, there are many people who live with an understanding of sin that's as shallow as that. That it's just kind of a base morality, a list of do's and don'ts. A thou shalt and thou shalt not. And have a very cursory and shallow morality. Following God is a list of, these are things I don't do, I don't say, I don't touch, I don't look at, and these are things I'm supposed to do and supposed to participate in and be a part of. 
Here's my list of do's and here's my list of don'ts. And there's morality. And many people and even many believers live with that type of shallow understanding of God's word and sin. The, the term sin or the concept of sin literally means to miss the mark. So imagine you're shooting at a target. And as you shoot at the target, you miss the target. That's a picture of sin. That here's where I'm to aim. This is the center of where I'm supposed to be. My thinking, my heart, my life, my behavior, even my attitudes. But I land outside of that. And when we begin to understand sin is not just simply this very plastic, very rigid, just do this, don't do that. We begin to understand that when we miss the mark, we can miss it pretty deeply and pretty broadly in a lot of ways. You see, for Jonah, you'd say, well, what, show me law. Show me the scripture that says he was required to do that. And I would say to you that this word talks more about a relationship with God and a journey with him than just a list of do's and don'ts. Do not Jonah know the story of Noah, a God who steps into his life and tells him to do something very hard? Does he not know the story of Abraham where God tells a man to leave what's his own, to go to a place that's not his? Does he not know the story of Moses who's commanded by God to walk into the very throne room of a wicked king? and speak truth and reveal the power of God into his life? Does he not know the story of Joshua, who was called to face down even the most vilest and roughest of people? Has he not seen men and read the stories of men like Elijah and Elisha, who stood alone in the face of great evil? You see, the Word of God and, and the idea and the concept of sin goes deeper than just a cursory morality of a list of do's and don'ts. But we can miss the mark in a lot of ways. But in fact, with Jonah, I would dare say his sin was not simply that he turned and ran, but there was something even deeper going on. Now, chapter 4 in the book of Jonah is the aftermath kind of passage. In chapter 4, we read about Jonah being upset that the Lord spared Nineveh, his, his God's uh, a pro prophetic message over Nineveh that he would destroy it was conditional. Conditional upon their repentance. They repented and so God relented. And Jonah's upset about that. He's upset about it. In fact, he even goes on and says to God, bold face to his face, says to God, this is why I didn't want to go in the first place. And we can look at Jonah's heart and say, yeah, he geographically tried to run to, from God, but the greatest sin in Jonah's life was not his legs, but his heart. To miss the mark before God is more than just a list of do's and don'ts. It's more than just God shows up in my life and directs me by His Spirit to do things. But I can miss the mark in the attitudes of my heart. What was God's heart over Nineveh? He says to Jonah at the very end of the book, he says, you have been concerned about a vine. We'll get to that at some point. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? You see, Jonah's sin went deeper than just the outward act. But sin goes to the very root of the heart. Did not our Savior tell us that a man commits adultery not simply when he commits the act, but when he lusts with his eyes and with his heart? Now, what's the point I'm trying to make? Brothers and sisters, many people look at this word as on a very cursory, very shallow level and feel that when it comes to the matter of sin or when it comes to the matter of righteousness, I need only know the cursory cultural do's and don'ts and mores uh, of Christian culture. In 2023, it's okay to play cards, but in the 1800s it wasn't. It's okay to dance today, but in the 1950s, you didn't do that in church. Right? 
well, the Word of God says, you know, don't say bad things and be nice to people. And for a lot of people, their study of God's Word goes no, no further than this. this. One of the most, listen to me, this is one, the, the, I want you to hear this. One of the greatest concerns that I have about the modern church today is that we've gone to God's Word for affirmation and validation, not transformation. Most of us approach God's Word with a desire for affirmation and validation, not transformation. This Word was given to us, yes, to know God, but also to know His heart and to know ours. so that we can pursue the righteousness of God more than just thou shalt and thou shalt not, but to know His heart and adjust our lives radically, not just simply to a list of rules, but to follow a Savior, a Messiah, and be His disciples. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not feel bad all day. That would be the anthem of most Christians and their desire of God's Word. In fact, many Christians today bypass God's Word and read a devotion because that actually feels better sometimes than reading God's Word. Now, I have nothing against devotions, and God can use the writings of man to illuminate Scripture, but they are no substitute. Make sure you're doing both. And if you must choose one, choose Scripture. I've hidden God's word in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful in making me feel good and satisfying all my self-help needs. Now, what does the Scripture say? All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Word of God was given to us to transform us, not to validate our feelings and make us feel good, but to reveal to us the heart of God and our own hearts where it misses the mark. On a cursory shallow level, we could, Jonah could have maybe felt very secure because he kept kosher kitchen and the sacrifices, and I'm a good little Jew, but we know he was going far beyond that because he didn't obey God, right? God shows up, but it went even deeper than that. His heart wasn't in line with God, and that too is sinful and a missing of the mark. The book of James speaks of those who simply hear the word and don't do it. And it says this, do not miss, merely hear the, listen to the word and, dece and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away immediately and forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. That's the modern view. We go into this word and we go, oh, but 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 and then we walk away and we forget what we look like. And for Jonah and for those that would wish to defend him, you say, what law did he break? Well, he disobeyed God. No, it was more than that. He had a heart that was not in line with the heart of God. And as we study this word, it'll take us deeper into righteousness. It'll take us deeper into that walk and understanding of God. I would say this for the for the for the for the for the for the nominal convert, the list and do's and don'ts is all they desire. For the middling servant, they only want to know the voice of God and what to do. But for the disciple of Jesus, they want to know his heart and how to be like him in every way. And this word, studying it, meditating on it. Jeremy's opening was talking about the endless nature of the precepts of God. That it's not shallow. It's not cursory but that the, the, the ardent servant of God who wants to deal with the sin in his life and experience freedom goes to this law that gives freedom, goes to this word that gives freedom, not to be affirmed, not to be validated, but to be transformed daily. 
one of the greatest sins of our age is that we allow our age to dictate Scripture. We tell Scripture what we believe and we adjust it to us. That is a grievous sin. Brothers and sisters, how sweet it is for the man or woman of God to let the Word of God speak to their heart and change them. To adjust their attitudes. To conform them to the, to the, to the image of Christ through His Word. That to conform this world word to the world in which we live in. What was Jonah's sin? Yeah, he disobeyed God. But more than that, his heart wasn't with God and wasn't where God's heart was. And we wouldn't know that unless we really knew the heart of God in His Word. The second reality that we see in the story of Jonah is, is that his sin, that sin can present itself with convincing rationalizations. So God comes to Jonah and says, go to the city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. Now, I told you earlier that, that chapter 4 gives us a little bit of an understanding of what Jonah was feeling in this moment. So Jonah gives commentary to this moment in chapter 4. In chap, you know, this is why I ran. Okay, This was what was on my heart. When I bought the tickets and headed to Tarshish, when I when I when I when 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 Assyria is over here, I went over here. And this is what it says, Jonah chapter four verse two. He prayed to the Lord, "Isn't this what the what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are." are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. He said, the reason I ran is I wanted these people to get what they deserve. I didn't want you to be merciful to them. Now, why would Jonah say that? And I'm going to defend Jonah for a moment. Okay, I'm going, I'm going to, because what Jonah, Jonah's concern, now even God himself admits that he has seen their wickedness come up before him. Okay? And so as God even talks about the Assyrians, the Ninevites, God himself has seen their wickedness. And what do we mean when we say that? You know, on any short list of people who have ever lived, the Assyrians would be on the short list of some of the most wicked people that ever lived. Let me give you, let me give you an analogy. Let me give you an example. Imagine our, what, what, would, what would we consider as Americans our palace or where our leader lives? The White House, right? Now, if you went into the White House and you looked at the art in the White House, what would you expect to see? Probably you'd be expecting to see people and scenes that convey a message about the, the integrity the bravery, the courage, the freedom, and the cause of the American experiment. You'd see busts of people like, you know, Thomas Jefferson, and, 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 and you would see paintings of people like Abraham Lincoln, and scenes like the, the crossing of the Delaware. And you'd see art throughout the, the White House that would convey a message about the nation, right? A nation that aspires to freedom and integrity a nation that aspires to bravery and courage. So let's go to the Assyrian palaces. What hung on their walls and what was their art? We know because we've dug them up and looked at them. Do you know what hangs on their walls? Scenes of mutilation and torture. These were people that worshipped, all but worshipped, torturing human beings of all ages, stripes, and people. They celebrated it. And there was a hardly a land or a place you could go where the Assyrians did not leave people who were mutilated. All for the glory of their own perversion and evil. And they celebrated it. They erected monuments to it. They hung depictions of it on their walls to speak of it as their glory. Here's a quote from Asher Banipal II, one of their kings, found in an inscription of him speaking. 
This won't exactly ring the words of freedom like Abraham Lincoln. He said this, I let the leaders of the conquered cities be flayed. If you don't know what that is, I'm glad you don't know what that is because there's children here and I use that word instead of describing it. And he goes, I let the, the conquered cities be flayed and clad the city walls with their skins. Now imagine you're Jonah and you're living under the shadow of that. And you've seen the people who have been mutilated by these wicked people, and you live in the shadow of that. That's the nation encroaching upon yours. That's the people who are licking their lips to destroy you. And you've seen the horrors they bring. Inexcusable that they celebrate. And now I'm supposed to go and share a message that's going to save those people? It's going to spare those people? And I'm going to pause for a moment and say, yes. Because sin is not dictated by the heart, emotion, or experiences of man. In fact, the original sin was presented to Adam and Eve in the manner of Satan saying, you can be God yourself and decide for yourself what is right and wrong. And we live in a day and an age that says that humanity has the right to go before the living God and dictate what is right and wrong. And I've seen people, I've sat across from individuals who've looked me dead in the eye and are guilty and have been guilty of grievous, offensive sins before the Lord and justify it. Claim for them it is okay because someone else is evil. Because of the day and age we live in. Because you don't understand my circumstances. And brothers and sisters, in the day and age in which we live, our culture, our society, even hell itself will provide you every excuse that is necessary to believe the lie of sin. Brothers and sisters, we all sin. Okay, there are moments when sin, we, 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 sinners sin. And until we're with Christ one day and fully sanctified, that will, that will be a struggle we'll always fight. But brothers and sisters, sin continues because of the lie we tell ourselves. Continuous, repetitive sin is born out of lies. The rationalizations we tell our hearts and our minds. Satan is the father of lies. And he keeps us in sin by enticing us to buy the lie. And sin has no more power. And Satan has no more power than that which we're willing to give him. And that which we're willing to give sin. And the, and the, and the, and, and, and the, the mental gymnastics that we're willing to do to excuse our behavior in our marriages. Let's just take marriage as an example. When we sin within our marriages, what's always the rationalization? 99% of the time, it's because they did this. Therefore, I'm justified in that. That's just stupid and a lie. Another sin does not justify my own. Why do we refuse to follow the Lord's command and forgiveness? Because this instance is different. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. There are instances where we may have to step back from an individual or a situation, but it doesn't mean we hold on to bitterness and anger and evil thoughts and resentment. That we can lay down at the cross. I could go on and on and on, but sins has le the sin will have legs in our lives as long as we play the game of lies. Now, I don't want to steal too much of my own thunder, but if you go down to point two, the, the Jonah's struggle illustrates the process of repentance. That first cross I have there, it says, repentance begins when the games stop. Repentance begins when the game stops. And it wasn't until Jonah was willing to be accountable for his behavior, 
He could rationalize his sin saying, Lord, look at those people. They don't deserve it. That is no rationalization in the face of an almighty God who says, this is what my heart is on the matter. Sin continues because of lies. Lies we tell ourselves and others. Sin ends when the lies end. Sin ends when the games end. The final reality that we see of sin in this passage that, that Jonah's life so powerfully illustrates is the pain it causes in the life of a servant of God. Jonah is not a, uh, a man distant from God. He's a prophet of God. Yet we can see in the life of a, a person who loves God or, 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 or a, per, a person who, who has a relationship with God the effect that sin can have. And it is grievous and it is great. The first thing that we see is that sin separates us from a relationship with God. It's interesting. There comes this moment when, when, when the men on the ship are, are concerned about what's happening. And they go to Jonah and say, you know, who are you? Where are you from? You know, tell us a little bit about yourself because a lot fell on Jonah. And Jonah tells them that he says, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven and, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? And this is why they were terrified. They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had told them so. Now, brothers and sisters, what's so beautiful about the cross of Christ is not just that the penalty of our sin is vanquished, and not just that we can experience victory over sin, but that sin destroyed our relationship with God. And by the sacrifice of Christ, that relationship with God that was destroyed by sin is repaired. The way of the, temp, the, way of the, uh, of the curtain, the, the curtain that held us back from the holies of holies is literally torn at the crucifixion of Christ. Brothers and sisters, every time we sin, we put a stitch back in that curtain. Every time we sin, we, 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 we get out the curtain rod and we hang it back up again. And we put that divider between us and our Lord. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They covered themselves and they hid from God. I use this analogy often because it speaks to my heart. I love my father. I have a good father. And when I was a child, I was so excited when he came home. My dad worked hard and worked long. And so often when he came home, it was, it was late. And so I was so excited as a kid to see the, the, the headlights come up the driveway, to hear the door pop open. And, and just to, just, you know, like, like my dad had a, like people have a sound, you know what I mean? Like as they walk, as they move, to hear my dad come in, to smell his aftershave. My dad always took all the contents out of his pocket. And he usually was filled with goodies like candy and, and coins because my dad worked at Pepsi. So he often found interesting coins and things like that. And he would throw his stuff on the counter. And I listened to him talk to my mom. There's nothing that, that blesses a child's heart more than to hear a, 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 a mother and a father bless one another and talk. But then as a child, you know, one of the primary sensations or one of the primary emotions that a child feels, particularly when their father is home, is a sense of safety. One of the things that a father provides for his children is that sense, that most primal need to feel safe. And it's one of the primary gifts that the presence of a father provides for a child is a sense of safety. And I remember dad being home and there was just kind of like, ah, dad's home. That was many nights. There were a lot of other nights where I had sinned that day. And those headlights were not welcomed with joy. But my little eyes were blinded by that light. I'd hear the door open and it was a sound uh, of impending doom. He would take the, the items out of his pocket and, and throw them onto the, onto the counter. And it sounded like the gavel of the judge coming down on me. And instead of his presence making me feel safe, it made me feel vulnerable. Now, had my father changed? No. But sin had changed my view of him. 
Sin had changed my beauty. Brothers and sisters, let me take that one step further. Jonah also leaves God's people. Now, we never say this as a church, and I'm going to say this in love. There are a lot of reasons why people may feel distant from their church, but one of them that we never address is our own sin. Sometimes the reason the people of God look like they've changed is because our hearts have changed and there's sin there. Because you can look at what happened with, with, with Adam and Eve in the garden immediately. Their view of each other changed, didn't it? That woman you gave me. He would lord over her and she'd want for his position. Immediately it changed. Sin breaks our relationship. Look at what Jonah's doing when the world's falling apart. He's asleep. I mean, the captain's like, how can you do that? That's how hard it made his heart. He cared nothing for what was happening right around him, the people that were suffering, nor what God's activity was. He slept a deep sleep. He had to be roused from it. And sin deadens our hearts to God and one another, but it also deadens our heart to his mission. Think about the glorious joys Jonah could have experienced if he had obeyed and gone straight to Nineveh. The lives that could be changed. And nothing takes us from the center of God's will and his mission and work more than sin. But as well, and we don't want to admit this, but sin also affects others. Look at the cost to others that sin caused. We think sin is a self-contained disease. In fact, many preachers will compare sin to cancer. And I think that's a good analogy within the individual. But where that analogy falls short is that cancer tends to be self-contained. It remains with the individual. In ancient times, they often compared sin to leprosy. Its impact went far beyond just the individual that had it. And the influence of our lives and the impact on our own heart and soul shows up in the lives of others. So is God's discipline. And tell me that God's discipline over a man's life may not affect his family as well. The scriptures show that again and again, do they not? Sin's consequences for the prophet of God are real. And they are ugly and they are awful. And we lie to ourselves. Just as Satan lied, you will not surely die, the serpent says. The scripture tells us that when sin is full grown, it produces death. Brothers and sisters, sin is no game. And for those who have been set free to it, from it, its damage and its harm is very real. Now, what's the point of the message today? It's actually joy and freedom. I know this is heavy. But for those who are willing to do the work of repentance, repentance begins in a hard place. I mean, even tonight, we're going we're gonna to celebrate communion. And tonight, even as we celebrate communion, it begins in a hard place, the reality of our sin and the need of a Savior. And as we look at a life that seeks to live free from sin, we have to be honest with ourselves and with God and call it what it is. It is the great evil that keeps us from God and one another. It is the curse and it is the thing that we ought to, if, I, I heard it once said, it was a quote about or the early church, that early Christians feared nothing but one thing. The Christians feared nothing but one thing. And do you know what that one thing was? Sin. Now next week we'll dive into that beautiful picture of repentance, but it's going to be harder than just over dinner going, sorry, God. And we're going to look at that journey of repentance together. But for today, today is that kind of gut moment where we just come before God in honesty 
and say, reveal to me my heart. Lord, speak to me now. For some, it may be an activity in their life that clearly, something that they've allowed in their life that clearly ought not to be. For others, it might be an attitude. Maybe there's an arrogance that slipped into our hearts that keeps us from the full fellowship of believers. Maybe there is an attitude towards other people in our lives that's not lining up with the target of Jesus Christ. My prayer is today that we would hunger for this word, not for affirmation and validation, but for transformation. That I would go to this word in earnestness, that I could know the heart of God and know my heart, that I might not sin against Him. That I could be corrected and trained, rebuked, so that my life could match up to the heart of Jesus. Secondly, I would put down the lies. Our world lies so much about what sin is and what isn't. We don't need to help. The lies need to end. Sin continues where lies continue. But then finally, to swallow hard, God's discipline for sin for those He loves is real. The consequence for, to our relationship with God and others and brothers and sisters in Christ is real. The penalty for our sin in the lives of other people is real. And it's not a trifling. Brothers and sisters, our Savior is amazing, isn't He? We're going to sing in a moment that song, Whiter Than Snow, right? Christ came and He gave His life and paid the price for sin. You say, Pastor, why are we staying there? Why do we have to talk about that when Christ set us free? It's because the sinful capacity of the human heart to return to the vomit of sin is still there. And we got to call it what it is and show it for what it is so that each and every one of us can experience not just one day the penalty of sin being released, but now it's bondage. May the precious blood of Jesus Christ wash us whiter than snow today. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the story of Jonah. We often depict this story in a kiddish kind of way. It's a fun story that kids love, and there's nothing wrong with that, Lord, but we, we are grown up and we put childish things behind us. This is real stuff. This is more than just the novelty of a man being swallowed by a, a, a large sea creature, a, a whale, or a large fish. This is a story about a man who dissipated you, and in chapter 1 we see the seeds of that, the consequences of that, and it's no joke. Lord, illuminate our hearts. You say, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Lord, we have chosen to grieve over our sin today, to do that real work. Joy is coming, Lord. More encouraging messages are coming, but Lord, we as your church, we want to have our hearts aligned with yours. So we're not afraid to do this work, Lord. The work of looking into your word, the, the, the work of, of letting your spirit convict us of, of, of judgment, righteousness, and sin. The work of being willing to adjust our lives to the heart and the way of the living God. And Lord, we will expend our lives seeking to be more like you. Keep our hearts repentant. Keep our hearts tender. Keep our necks pliable and not stiff, Lord. And keep us walking with you every day. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together, number 310.